Um, well, first off, um, something a little bit different. I'd like to welcome David, VK5 DGR, who's going to talk to us about using Codec 2 for VHF uh, digital voice, and I'm, I'm pretty sure this is David's first visit, so yes. thanks for coming, David. You're welcome. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. This is uh, my first visit to Gibstead, and uh, it's been a great trip so far. I've really enjoyed meeting everyone and looking at the fine work you've been doing. Uh, yeah, my name's David Drake. I'm from Adelaide. Uh, and I've been, over the last few years, I've been doing a lot of work with uh, uh, an open source speech codec called Codec 2. In particular, being applied to VHF radio, uh, but now we're starting to look at some applications in the VHF radio. So today I'll be talking about um, what we've done today, which is um, the Coding 2 development, um, FreeDV, which is uh, what we call the whole codec modem, the whole mode, if you like, that operates. Um, a piece of hardware we've developed to run it called the SM1000. I'd like to talk a little bit about codecs and patents. Um, at the moment, to use digital voice, uh, Basically, you need to use a patented closed codex that you're not allowed to experiment with. And that runs a little bit against the grain for ham radio, so we've been doing our best to overcome that. Um, software defined radio, and where I see it going, and the part that uh, uh, the people I'm working with and myself would like to play in that. <coughs> How we've achieved over a 10 dB gain uh, over FM uh, using uh, digital voice, and now we're starting to get improvements on SSP using digital voice, so better performance. Uh, for voice than anyone's ever done before. A demonstration, if I can get some files to play through the, the audio system here. Um, and some applications that we can do with this 10 dB gain. What, what can we do with that in the VHF uh, two-way radio area? And how you can get involved. So this is a typical uh, digital voice radio system. Uh, we have a microphone, some sort of analog digital, digital converter. Uh, that converts it to a fairly high rate bit stream. Then some sort of codec. Now for digital voice, we need a really tight compression ratio. Um, typically beneath the 5,000, 8,000 bits per second use of voice over IP. Uh, we're playing it around the um, 1,300 bits per second for a lot of the HF work, and recently uh, down to 700 bits per second. Uh, and uh, so quite, <coughs> quite heavy compression. Usually there's some sort of forward error correction. We had some redundant bits and extra information to protect uh, the bits of the codec from bit errors over the channel. Uh, then through a modulator, uh, some sort of uh, motor that lets you take it over a HF or VHF radio channel. Uh, at the moment, we're hooking these things up to existing HF and VHF radios through the microphone and speaker ports, but that's going to be changing soon. We're going to start developing our own custom radios to get the best possible performance. Mm. Uh, on the other end, uh, some sort of demodulator, uh, uh, forward error correction decoding to correct some of those errors that you've got over, over the radio channel, uh, and then the uh, Codec 2 speech decoder out an out speaking bike to total lock converter. Okay, so what's FreeDV? It's open source digital voice for HF radio. So all the software is shared, just like uh, you know we've been sharing hardware designs forever. This is all the software is open and anyone can play around with it if you want to. Uh, it comprises of the codec, a modem. We've developed special modems for the HF radio channel. In some cases, some forward error correction although FEC doesn't always work too well on these sorts of channels <coughs> for technical reasons. And a GUI app application to bundle the whole thing up. So you can run it on a laptop or a PC uh, quite happily and plug it into your, uh, your HF uh, radio, SSB radio, via some sort of sound interface uh, box. Uh, there's also an API, so a programming interface. You can, because this is open software, it just comes as a library uh, of C code that can run on any Windows or, or Linux or embedded uh, CPU. Uh, so we've bundled it up into an API where you just you stick speech samples in one side and get um, modem samples out the other side. And that can be used to integrate it into other um, SDR projects. Uh, for example, Flex Radio in their latest firmware have released, a, you've now got a, a mode button for FreeDV. So you've got you know, CW, sideband, FM, <coughs> FreeDV. And that's using the API we've developed and they compile it right in uh, to their software. So you've got Flex Radio, you can run FreeDV now. <coughs> it's also been used for the uh, SM1000, uh, which is a little blue box here that was developed by myself and a few other hands around the world. Um, that's embedded FreeDV in the box. It's a little microcontroller. Uh, you, you plug in your uh, headset on one side, just a regular analog headset, and plugs into your radio uh, on the other side, and you get FreeDV in a box for about $200. I'll pass that around. I'm <coughs> 
Uh, and the latest news is just two weeks ago we released a, a new mode, uh, FreeDB 700, 700 bits per second for HF radio. Uh, and that operates um, down to the negative SNR ratios. So you're getting digital voice at very low signal to noise ratios. The quality is not great um, because of the low uh, bit rate we're compressing, but ne neither is low SNR SSB. So we're getting quite competitive now with the you know, legacy analog uh, technology that's been around for 50 years or so. Uh, later this year, uh, what we're currently working on is some VHF modes uh, for this technology and even some VHF hardware, our own radio, to do some experiments with. <coughs> This is what FreeDB, um, the, the GUI application looks like. So you can download this for Windows or for Linux um, and run it on your PC. Uh, you get a bit of a, a GUI display, there's a spectrum waterfall. Uh, that waveform you're seeing there is the spectrum of the FreeDB 700 waveform. Uh, and down the bottom is um, what's called the scatter diagram <coughs> that shows the quality of the, uh, of the modem <coughs> a QPSK signal. Gives you some feedback like bit error rate, signal to noise ratio, and allows you to um, you, know, you click on push to talk to talk. Uh, it can interface with your radio through the cat port and trigger the, uh, the radio controls. So a lot of people are using that around the world today. Um, that application combines a, a special modem that we've developed that's very robust. In fact, there's a couple of modems now, very robust for HF channels. So we put a lot of work into making the whole system uh, integrating and making it work well on HF channels. It's a desktop GUI application um, and you just hook it up to any old SSB radio. It's become reasonably popular in the last two years. The new mode um, has much better performance than the old one. The old one didn't perform as well as um, the FreeDB 1600 mode. It uh, doesn't perform quite as well as SSB. The new one does, uh, and it's made some <coughs> really uh, interesting calls. Like some guys have made, um, by turning the power down and pointing the beams in the wrong direction, they've sort of you know, stressed it. And they've done things like make calls over 1100 kilometers on just one watt. Um, the, the nature of, which is good for any sort of voice, uh, SSB or a digital. The interesting thing about digital is once you cross this sort of threshold and get above a certain SNR, more power won't help you. It won't sound any better. So uh, on any given channel, you can just turn the, turn the whip down until you're just getting errors, and that's, that's enough power for the rest of the QSO. So, so uh, that's, and it's also across the Atlantic between Germany and Texas on TV, which uh, hasn't been done too often before. So we're waiting to hear a few of those signals down here from the US as well. Most of the test team and activity is in the US. <coughs> Uh, SM1000 smart mic, a little wood box being handled around. It's an embedded free DV, you don't need the PC. Um, the reason behind developing that was that um, at the moment to do digital voice you need your rig plus you need a PC. It gets a bit unwieldy, especially if you're mobile or so doing sober or something. So we're getting it down to one box. Now it's actually um, a speaker mic, it has a built in speaker and microphone. So you can unplug your existing PTT mic and plug that in and then just press the button on the side talking to it. It's got uh, a built in um, all the interfaces you need, so it's like a rib blaster type interface, transformer, uh, opto isolated interfaces to your uh, your rig's uh, microphone and speaker input, uh, and uh, opto isolated to the PTT. So you press the PTT button on the side of the SM1000, your rig goes into transmit, you talk into the microphone, it digitizes it, compresses it, turns it into a modem signal which gets fed into your microphone input, and away it goes over the air as a digital voice signal. Uh, on receive, the signal comes out of the rig's uh, speaker <coughs> the output, port, goes into the SM1000, gets demodulated, the modem tones into a bitstream, the bitstream then goes into the speech decoder, gets turned uh, into uh, analog speech and comes out the speaker. You can, it's got a variety of interfaces, you can plug in your own headset. There's people using the mobile, uh, it was designed by HAMS um, and for HAMS. Myself and several other HAMS around the world worked on that and we're getting the mass produced in China. We sold out the first batch straight away, there's another batch in production right now. <coughs> it's all based on open hardware and software. You can download the schematics right now if you want to. Fool around with it, the software's all open, you be experimented with. So all, all completely open. Uh, those of you haven't seen the box yet, that's a, a, a different close up. At the front you can see the various interfaces, so the external mic, external speaker. They're all in parallel with an RJ45. A lot of radios these days have an RJ45. It's got a little patch panel inside so that you can interface it to your, your particular radio. Uh, with the second batch, we're getting some cables made. Um, a lot of hams these days will struggle a bit to solder up the cables. You need to interface this to the radio, so we're getting some custom cables made as well for various radios. Benefits of manufacturing in China. <coughs> That's the printed circuit board of the um, 
SM1000. This was laid out by a US hand, but I've been working on it. I did the schematic for it. We did some of the schematics together and I did the firmware for it. <coughs> uh, in the middle, now it's working again. Is there a laser pointer I can use? Or... Thank you. <coughs> okay, so the Brains is a microcontroller. It's an STM32F4. Uh, it's just an ARM4 micro, uh, or microcontroller. But these days they're so powerful. Like this has got a, a mega flash, a couple hundred K of RAM, runs at 200 megahertz. It's the class of processor that would go in your router for your, your DSL, but it doesn't have an operating system. It's just operating like a regular microcontroller. And that does all the modem, all the codec. Um, it's got built in A to Ds and D to As. Um, so really that's the heart of the whole thing. And you can flash it via USB. So, uh, and they're only 10 bucks or $8 in volume or something. So really cheap. Um, so really that's the heart of the SM1000. That does all the signal processing. And then um, down here we've got a, um, some analog interfaces, a built-in microphone. So there's a microphone amplifier. Uh, over here, transformer isolation, <coughs> radio. Uh, RJ45, which provides one way of connecting physically to your radio. The other way is uh, a whole lot of 3.5 millimeter jacks along the base here that are really in parallel. With the RJ45, there's a little patch panel here. You can move wires or put a, deal, put a header on that. So you can figure for your particular radio for the RJ45. Um, down here is a switch mode power supply. That caused a little bit of pain with uh, you know, EMI or RF noise. But we managed to make that quiet enough. It, it operates off um, up to about 18 volts and draws, um, gee, I think 200 milliwatts or something. Anyway, it'll run off a couple of little batteries all day, much, much longer than your radio will. Um, and on the other, the other face, there's a volume control uh, power switch, some mode buttons and LEDs. Uh, and a PTT button along the side there. So at the moment it's um, you can operate in two modes. You can hold it in your hand like a PTT mic. Ergonomically it's not really, you know, it's a sort of chunky rectangular box, so it's not the prettiest microphone you've ever had. But um, it does work, and if we get into the volume we'll get a, a nice plastic enclosure uh, made for it. Or a lot of people just want to put it on the desk and operate it with a headset. You can operate it both modes quite happily. Uh, these trim pots will adjust the levels to and from your radio and the mic gain. And there's a volume control here for the speaker. And the speaker's you know, adequate for normal rooms. Okay, so that's the SM1000. I'd like to talk a bit about software defined radio and where I see that going and how this works fits in. Um, over the last 10 years, I guess we've seen this, this hardware um, where the red box is now software defined radio. That's where the hardware is. 10 years ago, our radios were all hardware, so the red box sort of extended out to here. Um, in that case, we probably didn't have a codec and modem, we had an analog modem, and we were using you know, analog techniques. But now, suddenly, the, this is all turned into software, um, and now the um, hardware is, this is what's left. So we're seeing this gradual, I guess, trend to all the hardware components being absorbed into software. Uh, and my argument is the software can be open, and it means it can be free. We can share it with each other. We don't have to lock it down and patent it and make it hard to experiment with. We can open it up so we can all play and, uh, and do interesting new things. You know, and I see eventually the hardware is going to be the antenna, and even complex analog things today will be replaced by you know a direct a D to A that's sampling at microwave frequencies or an A to D, for example. Now that's a fair way off, but what we're already seeing is you know sets that do this, most of this in software. Um, so that's where I see the trend going in the future. And I want to make sure when all that stuff does move to the software, that it's software that we have access to and can work on. So, yeah, the general trend is hardware migrates into software. Um, it always does. This has happened across many industries, not just, uh, not just our hobby. Um, what's hardware today? And big boxes with flashing lights is going to be software and app on your mobile phone tomorrow. Uh, the because as we, we keep getting more and more CPU available. The bandwidths we're playing with are about the same. They're set by, you know the bandwidth of our voice, but we're getting more and more uh, software capability. So eventually everything's going to be done in software. The software can be free, which means it can be open for us to experiment with. And if you write open source software and distribute it, it can also be free as in you don't have to pay the money for it. Um, so radio communications can be free. And that means you know, free as in free beer, but also free as in free speech. Uh, we don't have people telling us what modems and protocols and codecs that we're going to use. We get to decide and experiment with it. And, and I would argue that communication should be free. Uh, not only in ham radio, but also outside uh, for other applications. So, the reason I got into this was about 
five or six years ago, I was contacted by uh, Bruce Perens, and he said, look, ham radio is going digital, but it's all going into proprietary code, that's a problem, what can we do? Uh, I had a background in speech compression, in, in, I guess, the academic area, and I had a, a speech code gathering dust on the shelf. So uh, I got that <coughs> interested and started working on it. Um, and the problem is with proprietary codecs is they come in hardware or software license form. They're difficult to distribute. You need a license key for software or you need uh, to buy physically buy some hardware. You can't just download it. Um, they can't be modified. Um, so if you want to change it a little bit because it's not quite working for application, you're not allowed to. Um, and in fact, it's illegal under the license terms. And you don't have to decide and play around with it. Now, how would you guys feel if someone said, oh, you know, you can't play that FM radio inside of that SSB. It's actually illegal. We're going to stop you doing that. We're going to get the lawyers in. <coughs> well, that's basically what the guys with proprietary codex are proposing to accept. Um, understanding how they work is discouraging. Uh, you won't find much information or explanation about how they work, uh, which is kind of the key to a hobby like ours. <coughs> There's another problem with codec royalties. Um, I've, I've owned small businesses that have used speech compression for various applications. Um, and they charge you, well this is for a codec called G729, which is used for voice over IP. But I've sp spoken to people who have licensed the Ambi codec, and it's a similar sort of dollar for money. Um, single digit dollars per unit, per radio, and this sort of money up to 100k if you're a manufacturer and you want to start using it. Um, it's a useless tax on business and communication. It doesn't help me to pay that money. Um, I'm, it's, it's just benefiting the people who hold the payments and receiving the royalties. Um, basically, it makes a closed source code, it makes a small number of people very rich and stifles innovation and education for everyone else. Um, whereas an open source codec can help a large number of people and promotes innovation and education. So really, they're just toll booths on the sort of activities we have to play with. <coughs> now, and here's the dirty little secret. Um, these guys borrowed very heavily from the public domain for their codecs. Maybe 5% of what they use is actually original to these companies. And for that 5% and the 95% you and I all own, it's public domain, they're charging it back to us. And they just pay some money. So they've installed these neat little toll booths. But the, the cool thing is, if you're prepared to do something that's not on their standard, so it won't be interoperable, but it will sound the same and work the same, perhaps even better, we've, we can exceed their performance in some places. You really just need to work around that 5% that's patented. And um, that's what we've successfully been able to do. <coughs> so this is this whole sort of area that I'm playing with, I guess, is like open software radios. Um, we want as much of the software in our radios to be open. Uh, and we want to drive towards the smallest amount of hardware. Uh, well, that's the trend that's going to happen. We're going to get less and less hardware, more and more software. We want both of those to be open, if possible. <coughs> Okay, so what we've been able to, be able to do with some of these um, open source ideas, codecs, modems, etc., is actually get a 10 dB gain uh, with digital voice over existing legacy FM and first generation digital systems, digital voice systems with VHF. So last year um, I started looking at what was happening with current VHF modems for data and digital speech. I actually started looking at FM, uh, FSK over FM, used to things like APRS. And I discovered that there was a big problem with the modems being used with legacy FM radios. Uh, a lot of performance was being lost in the use of legacy FM radios with FSK demodulators. Um, so then I took a look at the application to, um, to voice uh, for analog FM and first generation digital voice. And I discovered there was a big performance drop uh, that was being put up with at the moment by these systems that we could do better. Um, and it's basically around the demodulator and radio design. Um, so, with the current radios are all based on this idea of having an existing FM radio, FM demodulator followed by the demodulator. And the next few slides I'll show you what that's a bad idea and how we can do better. But using a, a low bit rate codec and a good demodulator, we've demonstrated gains of over 10 dB. So, here's how to do a digital voice radio the bad way and the good way. Currently, what, what most people are doing, and this, this is even happening in DMR and, and commercial digital systems is we take a, an FM radio with an FM demodulator and then we put a, um, some sort of uh, <coughs> demodulator on the end of that to get the bits out and then feed it into a speech codec. Unfortunately, between that, that architecture of using uh, an FM demodulator, an analog FM demodulator and a, uh, followed by the modem, is, uh, you get a, a lot of losses. I'll show you why in a moment. 
This is um, down the bottom. This graph is signal to noise ratio, but I'm using um, C on N naught. Now N naught is um, really like your noise floor. It's a noise bandwidth. Rather than measured in three kilohertz, it's just measured in one hertz. It's useful when we want to compare to modulators with different uh, noise bandwidths. So when you're comparing FM to SSB to digital, they all tend to have different bandwidths of the input and the modulator. The C on N noise is a fairing measure. Uh, the red curve is what we're currently getting with FM radios. So we get this threshold effect. Um, the blue curve is SSB. And uh, once we get above a certain threshold, the output signal to noise ratio from the FM to modulator for a given input signal to noise ratio exceeds uh, SSB. So FM up here is better than SSB. Then it sort of falls over, and at this point here, uh, when you get beneath the signal to noise ratio, you're better off using SSB. So we tend to use SSB for our long shots, um, and FM when we've got good, good high quality SNR. Now the problem is, is all, all the first generation digital voice systems are tacking on the digital system to an FM to modulator, so they have to operate up here, otherwise the FM's falling over. If you do it with a software defined radio, or even an SSB radio, and put the demodulator onto that, then you could get this sort of performance down here. <coughs> now, on top of that, we're also coming up with techniques that are better than SSB from our HF work. We're starting to get in the negative SNR regions. So we're talking about, for digital voice, we can start playing down here. Um, up to, at the moment, we're at 10, 13 dB better than FM, but it's possible to get perhaps 20 dB better, uh, 20 dB better than FM and still get voice through the system, which is a pretty big gain. So the basic problem is, when we tack it onto an FM demodulator, um, we're basically constraining ourselves to this sort of signal to noise ratio as an above. Uh, you need the FM demodulator to be performing before you can get decent digital voice out of the system. This is another way of looking at it. This is a graph for digital systems. What we're interested in is bit error rate. Um, because as digital bits come through, if these bits are corrupted, then our digital voice sounds bad. We get R2D2 voices out of the digital system. So this, along this axis here, is the bit error rate. Um, 10 to the minus 2 is 1% bit error rate. It's about where code 2 is happy in this sort of 10 to the minus 2. Beneath that, it doesn't really matter. You won't hear any better. The speech won't get any better. That's the threshold. So we're interested in this line across here. Down here, once again, is C on N0. Um, so it's just like your signal. It's just equivalent to the signal to noise ratio. <coughs> In this case, it's, it's, uh, we're running on a um, 4800 bits per second system, which is common for first generation digital voice systems. <coughs> now, if you build a receiver like this in the red box, then you get a bit of a curve like the blue one. <coughs> so to get 10 to the minus 2 bit error rate, which is where digital voice sounds good, you need to operate all the way out here around about that 50 dB mark. However, if you build a receiver like this, with an SDR or even sideband receiver here. Then you put the demodulator on. You get this curve, which is actually pretty close to the ideal curve that we can get by the, the limits of physics. So we get this gain of 42.5 to 47, or perhaps 48, <coughs> when they cross over. Now that's operating at 4,800 bits per second. That's actually really fast, and we can deliver pretty good digital speech at 1,200 bits per second. So when you lower the bit rate again, we can lower the signal to noise ratio back. Again, when you combine all those factors, we can get gains in, in excess of uh, 10 dB. This sounded a little bit too good to be true, so we set about demonstrating uh, with a Canadian man called Daniel. Um, he set up a, an SDR system uh, with his laptop to receive the signals, SDR dongle. This is a sound card attenuator. Uh, and he had a, um, we played some modem files through an SSB transmitter. Uh, just to get the, the right sort of waveforms we wanted on the air. So bypassing that whole FM radio paradigm that people are currently using for data and digital systems. Uh, then he got in his car and drove around, and we tested out various different <coughs> noise ratios, and we, we played uh, FM signals alongside the digital, uh, our new digital voice signals, and compared the two. So this is a, a spectrogram, uh, times along this axis, this is about 30 seconds, First of all, through the same transmitter, at the same power, we played the digital signal. This is a 1200 bits per second, a GMSK, <coughs> we use the GMSK modem uh, that we developed, uh, holding the digital voice. 
then exactly through the exactly the same transfer, the same power level will play an FM signal. First there was a, some tone through the FM signal, then the actual FM. So we repeated that at various signal to noise ratios and then compared the speech quality through the two systems. So I'll now try to play some of those files. Um, but what we tried was different C on N noughts, which is just like different signal to noise ratios. And, you know, we noted there was a bit of a threshold effect with the digital. Once we got a, above a certain C on N naught, you simply couldn't hear any more uh, difference in speech quality. Um, and what we found was that uh, Indeed, the, the Codec 2 system did, did exceed the FM uh, in terms of quality, and I'll show you that in a moment. But we also found that at higher bit rate, or higher C9 noughts, we could start running higher bit rate codecs, like 8,000 bits per second. Simply because um, once you're above that threshold, if you've got some extra signal to noise ratio available, you basically get a, a much higher bit rate through the system. So every 3 dB of excess SNR you get, um, you can double your bit rate, so you can support much higher bit rate codecs if you want to. And that's something that um, current systems don't take advantage with uh, in a, uh, the current first generation digital systems. In fact, all the digital 2 way systems I'm aware of, if you get a high signal to noise ratio, speech quality does improve, they're just throwing away that extra bandwidth. Um, but it is possible to come up with a system that can play higher quality speech when your signal to noise ratio <coughs> is high. Now, let's see if I can do the samples.
which is a lot less than SSB. And we're, we're working towards getting something like that running over the course of this year. So if any of you guys are interested in long shots and want to do voice and very low SNRs, contact me and we'll uh, yeah, we can work together on that. Well, the other thing you can do is 10 dB is a factor of 10 in power. So we can talk about lowering our TX power, uh, which means extending the battery life. But the other thing that I like to play with is um, TDMA repeaters, so two or four slot repeaters, um, that can get rid of the diplexes entirely and come up with a very simple uh, repeater architecture. I've got, I'll talk a little bit about more about that in a moment. Um, if we've got 10 dB gain, it ends up getting 16 times the area coverage of your repeater. Um, of course, it's not quite so simple as that because you have terrain and other issues involved. Um, but uh, that's the sort of difference you can get with that power level. Uh, I've demonstrated how you can have some wideband audio. That was a, a better higher quality codec. But you can also talk about even wideband audio, AM quality, Skype wide quality coming through on VHF channels. Rather than this idea that audio has to be you know, band limited to 300 to 3000 hertz that we've been stuck with for the last 50 years. Why not have a CD quality audio in your car <coughs> driving along over the repair? Uh, and the channels can also support high data rates using the right sort of motors and receivers. So rather than you know, squirting them on a 300 board or something, we can talk about 100 kilobits per second over uh, similar, similar signal to those ratios. So TDMA repeaters are something that's really interesting. Um, they don't need a diplexer. <coughs> if ours, which, which takes away a whole lot of complexity straight away. The, the concept of the repeater I've got now, it'll be just like a $100 HT, but it'll be a different mode. <coughs> Just press a button, now it's a repeater. Put it on a hill, hook up a solar panel, and walk away. And you've got a repeater. And that changes the whole repeater paradigm straight away. That you've got this. At the moment, it's got to be one really big, complex, um, technically complex diplexes. You need to use the best hill in the place. If, if the repeaters are really um, easy to deploy at low cost, you can start thinking about all sorts of different ideas for them. It fixes band plan issues. Um, we can get the whole repeater in 5 kilohertz. Um, I demonstrated there. 1200 bits per second speech, which will fit comfortably in uh, each each direction, will fit comfortably in you know, 1500 hertz. So, in less than five kilohertz of RF band, we can have a full duplex, uh, uh, sorry, not full duplex, but a simplex repeater uh, if you do it using TDMA technology. Uh, we're interested in working with diversity where you trans, because the bandwidth is so narrow, it's no big deal to send a signal twice. If you send um, the modem signal, say, at um, 144 megahertz, but also send it at 145. You still only use a couple of kilohertz of RF bandwidth total. But the receiver, if a receiver can receive both those signals at once, the fading is uncorrelated. So if one of those signals is faded, the other one won't be. You can put them back together in the receiver. It's called diversity, and it can get rid of all these fade margin problems. So if you've only got one repeater on one site, as well on one frequency, um, you get all these problems with fades. And that's often why we add a lot of uh, margin um, to the link use high powers to get around those fading. But if you use diversity to get around the fading, um, you've got one strong and one signal's weak, and you can much lower powers. Uh, mesh repeaters. If these repeaters are very low cost uh, and easy to deploy, they can be talking to each other and relaying signals around. And as I said, it'll be just another mode for the radio. It won't be a specialised piece of kit. It does, however, require a custom TDMA radio. As I showed on the um, previous slides, everything we're doing at the moment um, is this paradigm of take existing VHF radio, maybe use the data port, or maybe not, just through the speaker, hook it up to a, a, a modem. That's the way you get a bad digital link. Um, and that's what we've been doing. So we've got to throw them out, unfortunately, I'm sorry, and uh, come up with our own custom radios. The good news is the radios are very simple because most of it's software. Um, we're using a platform like the SM1000 that I showed you before. It'll be that plus a very simple VHF radio, very low power because we've got this um, gain in performance, so that does make the radios very simple. And we're going to make sure they're open, so everyone can use them. Uh, we're not going to try and lock you down to you know, what ICOM or Yesu or TV sites are going to be using for the next 50 years. We, we're going to get to the site. Uh, another idea for um, having multiple bit rates is um, subcarrier uh, variable bit rate. Uh, we just transmit um, the data you really want to get through, so that core voice information, using most of your power. But um, at some reduced power level, you transmit another a high bit rate carrier with some supplementary information. If you can receive the low quality, uh, sorry, the high quality signal at the lower power level, then you get you know CD quality audio in your car as you're driving along at drive time. 
Uh, if you can't, you still get something that works. And it costs uh, very little except bandwidth because um, 0 dB plus minus 10 dB is approximately 0 dB. Um, so nothing really happens to your transmit power out there. <coughs> and we're very bandwidth efficient, as you recall. That 1200 bits per second fits into uh, about the same amount of RF bandwidth, 1200 bits. <coughs> so it doesn't cost as much uh, to add an extra carrier there compared to current uh, band plans and channel allocations. So, time to get involved. Um, you know, let's help push shape, open software towards the antenna. Uh, this is a real game changer. SSB and FM have been with us for 50 years, and now it's all going to change to DV. And how it changes is up to us. Um, a lot of the, the big names would like us to change to proprietary codecs and their current protocol of the day. Um, but I say we should have a bit of a say in that, and have a bit of fun while doing it. Um, so, you know, DV is going to become dominant. It's not a question of if, it's when. And do we want it to be open? It's your chance to get involved and make a bit of history. Um, we need help with VHF radio design. I'm sure a lot of you guys can help with that. Uh, C coding, just advocacy, just repeat this talk or get me to your local club and uh, talk about this sort of thing. Start up some free DV voice nets, get people using this stuff on the air, um, talks at your local club. If you want to contribute um, dollar wise, that's possible. Uh, we need test equipment. Or buy an SM1000, uh, like quite a bunch of people are doing. An example of how other people have contributed is um, Rick, um, KSX BMA, he did all the CAD work. He's a retired engineer who was looking for something, you know, you know, public service sort of work to do. So he's done a fine job at the CAD work for the uh, SM1000. And we just talk over Skype and um, we uh, check in our uh, the, the CAD work into version control systems online and share it overnight and review each other's work. It's been, it's been a joy to work with Rick, he's a great guy. Um, Daniel, uh, Canadian hand whose voice you heard on those samples. He had a lot of fun testing. So he'd uh, run around and take uh, samples of signals and email them to me. I'd run them through my signal processing software and, uh, and then he'd uh, go and repeat it again. We had a lot of fun doing that over my summer and his winter. Uh, uh, Dave, uh, he did a, work, a lot of work on the GUI uh, for the FreeDV application, which is the, the free software you can download and play with. Another guy called Mel Witten. Um, him and a, a bunch of guys have been DV advocates for 15 years, but they've been struggling because everything's been closed source or didn't work well on HF. But he's done a wonderful job at the sort of user land testing, getting it out there, running it over the air. A bunch of guys in the uh, eastern part of the US. Um, uh, and uh, attending a lot of the conferences. Uh, Free DV has booths at Dayton and all the other various ham, ham uh, fests around the world. So just advocacy and documentation, things like wikis. Uh, there's another gentleman who's been working on uh, Brady, he's, he's a student uh, over in the US, he's been working on VHF SDR prototype, and even con contributions in the IT area. Richard uh, Shaw has been working on the build system for FreeDV, how we make all this complex software get compiled and, and distributed. He's done a wonderful job. So, just to summarise, so radios are migrating from software to hopefully very simple hardware. Um, the key now is we own this whole stack of components. Uh, open codec, modem protocol, and even hardware. Um, that hardware, it's getting easier and easier to make our own hardware. Um, that was done by a couple of hams working part-time with a, a, a Chinese partner. So putting that sort of stuff into production. <coughs> Previously, you needed to be a, you know, a radio company to do that. Um, but now we're, we're quite confident. All you guys have the skills to design the radios. So that's the, the engineering and the manufacturing is getting easier. Um, no one can tell us where we can and can't experiment because it's all open software. The only limit is, is our imagination and the laws of physics. <coughs> so we own the stack and apologies to the other companies. <laughs> well, thank you very much, David. Questions? David? Yeah, I gather it's um, simplex um, and real time, the, the program. What sort of latency is there in the end? Uh, on the HF stuff, it's uh, maybe 100 milliseconds. Okay. Have you thought about actually um, make it non-real time? In other words, you you, might, you, know, you say something and then it takes five minutes to actually send it? Yes, there's a couple of ways we can do that. One is just slow the whole thing down. Mm -hmm. So you can talk and have it sent, say, half real time. Yeah. Uh, the other is, there is some advantage to having really long um, interleavers to get over fades. So uh, you can have... Uh, but it just kills the hope. There's been a fair bit of pressure from my test team in particular to make it as real time as possible, it's PTT. 
Because when you can play any further in the north of you, you were on the uh, In particular, fight, on fighting channels, yes, but not so much on VHF, because mm -hmm. the, the noise level is the same. The Quite vague. Right. There is one advantage, is if you want to use forward error correction, to use really good codes, you need long blocks. Like convolutional, is it convolutional coding you've been using? Well, if you want to use codes that approach the actual boundaries LDPC. of what we can do, you oh, okay. need like LDPC or Turbo, and they can be oh, yeah. tens of Polish. seconds yeah. at these coding rates, because the code blocks are saying 10,000 bits. If you're only sending it 700 bits per second, that's tens of seconds. So you can get some advantage there for long <laughs> Oh, my questions have been answered. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I have a question uh, regarding repeaters. Um, as you, have you ever thought, thought about the idea of maybe having a fully full duplex repeater since you're going into a TDMA system, right? Yes, certainly possible. Uh, and um, the only limitation I can see there is that you're introducing a timing component, right? And so you, you're going to have to have some sort of timing correction as one moves away. And I think inevitably that, that means you have a, a, a limit to the actual radius size of, of the repeater itself. For sure. That limit is set by the protocol. Yeah. We control the protocol. So we right. can decide if we want a 10,000 kilometer. Exactly, but then the trade-off is that you have less time slots, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. So have you run into any ITAR issues with the... Sorry, ITAR? ITAR, yeah, control of... Uh, technology. Oh, uh, so export, control now. export stuff? Yeah, well, yes, I have. Um, I have got told that Codex were on the uh, export control list in 25 minutes per second, and I had to apply the PSD and fill in a form and said weapons of mass destruction on the top. <laughs> 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 and they gave me an intention. David, yeah. before we be asked, maybe it might be good to explain, um, there's been quite a lot of talk about the uh, Possibility of DBSI actually infringing, you know, just you know, actually basically not able to patent what they're out, you know. And Bruce has been, you know, demonstrated. Where are we at with that? With like using the DBSI code? No, no. With DBSI actually, you know, but about, you know, maybe being pursued oh, for right. um, infringement yeah, of, of the open of the open source stuff. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I haven't really been following that part of it. I just like to stay right away. Yeah. In particular because I'm developing codex, it helps if I have no prior knowledge. <coughs> um, My explain and read the Dave's background. You, you had, what was your PhD was on speech codex? Speech compression, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, what's the what effect, if, well, what effects are you seeing on, on Doppler on some of these layers? Um, on HF, there's a bit of Doppler when you bounce off the ionosphere. We have developed modems to deal with all the you know, big phase and amplitude variations. But I'm not sort of thinking like aircraft and that sort of model. The, the, well, the modems, a lot of the modem we've developed has a really good, really wide acquisition range and good tracking. So I'd love to play with someone who has Doppler problems and see how it performs. It's just it hasn't been an issue we've hit. But even for satellite stuff, I understand the frequency shifts are quite wide <laughs> as it moves. So, but the modem can track it. We can track one hertz per second uh, of Doppler once it's acquired. What about issues like multi-part performance? Yeah, big problem on HF, and on that's that. what I've spent the last couple of years of my life working on. Yeah, yeah. but we've currently um, currently got a coherent modem that's operating okay in the multi-path environment on the CCI port channel. It's working really well. Yeah, it might point out the. Um, HF modem uses OFDM and the VHF modem is just that single carrier GM is going. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, have you thought about encryption or is, is that not on the plan? Um, my aim for this technology is kind of wider than ham radio, so yeah. there are some applications where encryption could be applied to it. It's digital, yeah. so go for it. There's even people who want to use the codec for secure telephones. Uh, something you can plug into a handset and have a secure call because people are concerned that everyone listening into phone calls yeah. these days. Yeah. <laughs> and, and <laughs> It's a good way to start a flame war if you mention on-hand radio. A lot of us here are playing around with microwave frequencies. Um, we're restricted uh, due to both battery life and the actual power we can generate, particularly at the upper microwave range. Um, if we can get another, now we'll generally run in narrow band, so we're already running SSD or maybe some digital modulation. What would be interesting is to try to use this with SSD to just give us a, a bit more ERP and, and yes, and uh, I'd be interested in, I'm sure there's other people. Yeah, for sure. We're at the point where with the early waveforms you can plug into your SSB silo and then 
try this at some various different signals. Yeah, I'm, really interested. I'm sure a lot of people will give us a bit more, you know, a bit, bit more. That's where we're heading. Leads. Yeah. yeah, we want to push it down to those negative SNR. Yeah, that's the You showed us Scatterplot, the uh, uh, GPS based Scatterplot before. I understand that you've incorporated that in, in the SDR. How do you get that out of the SSB radio? Like um, SSB radio just uses an up and down converter from audio baseband, just like you use a transverter as an up and down converter. So that's all the SSB radio is to me. It shifts it from audio up to a certain frequency. Then you have a, the modem runs on your laptop that takes that uh, modem tones, um, R2-D2 sounds, and converts it into speech. So hopefully that's sell R2-D2 sounds. <laughs> Wrong. Uh, no, I haven't played with the free DV a couple of years ago on HF and was uh, frankly a bit disappointed. It, it was a path from Melbourne to Canberra uh, with Walvis and uh, the signal wasn't noise free, but what seemed to kill it was the selective fade. Yes. Um, yes. I didn't know at the time what, what the problem was, but later on we played around with uh, the easy panel and I could actually see the selective fading taking place. And I figured that what was happening was that some of the carriers in the uh, and digital voice signal was just disappearing completely mm. and, uh, and the thing just fell over and it, it sounded... Uh, uh, That's right, Free, the original Freebie 1600 from it works, <coughs> but once you've got multipath fading, selective fading, it fell over. Yeah, and that's something we've been working on fixing in the latest modes and we're now getting performance you know, similar to SS3. <coughs> that's that's not, not included in the um, SM1000 frame? No, but that'll be, uh, because we've just released the, the better software, uh, we haven't had a chance to board it to the SM1000. We're still testing and tuning a bit. So will you be able to upload that? Yes, that'll be firmware released later this year. Um, it's actually been a really big problem to get digital voice work as well as analog on SSB. And that's why a lot of SSB radios are still analog to this day. It's the last bastion of analog radio, for good reason. It's a really tough problem, but we're getting there. Thank you. Uh, it's interesting that uh, I've been doing a bit of listening on noisy HF channels with wind signals, <coughs> and often with the icon analog radio, I can tell that they're there, but I can't get any intelligence out of it. I turned on the Annan SDR radio on the receiver, and I can hear <coughs> quite clearly out of the out of the software to find radio uh, with the, the noise filtering that comes with the software that they use. So, yeah. right. It's probably worthwhile pointing out that if people are interested, there's a uh, a, new, a, a forum for this on uh, yes. on email. Yes, that's right. There's, uh, What's it called? It's some free voice right? and the Codec 2 mailing list. Yeah. So if you want to be interested, just log on the code. Yeah. Subscribe to the Codec 2 mailing list, and that's where the, oh, where the action wow. is. Well, why don't you just talk about the um, the sort of intelligibility of the voice spectrum? Is there sort of areas within that spectrum that are sort of critical for intelligibility, and is that a sort of a static or a dynamic sort of issue to when you really want to? throw out as much data as possible. Yes, there's, there are some areas that um, what a speech codec does is throws away as much as possible okay. and still leaves intelligible speech. Okay. And with, in particular with the lower bitrate modes, such as 700 bits per second, we're, we're trying to hit those limits of where we can, where it sounds horrible, but it's still intelligible, you know, still get a signal report against it. And it, yeah, it's time varying. The way we perceive speech is various peaks in the speech spectrum. It's like a time varying filter. So uh, what a speech codec does is just attempts to preserve those peaks in the speech spectrum uh, as it passes over the channel. I'd be very interested to attempt this type of thing on 23 seconds DME. We've got a lot of operation fading, a Doppler shift and all that kind of stuff. Yes, I'm interested in understanding what, what that channel is like uh, in terms of those sort of impairments because we've just spent a lot of time playing with HF, so it'd be interesting to see if we can address EME or other VHF channels. Doug, Free, or and myself will be able to do it on SSB, um, but listening to your demo where you've got that first one, that clip that you played, where the SSB was only telling you, that's like That was actually FM. That's, yeah, that's, so that's sort of like what EME sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> if you can pull speech out like that, it would be as, as dramatic as the change when uh, uh, WSJT came along and uh, all, all of a sudden small station EME started up. Yeah, well, that's what, what we'd like to do. And as uh, the gentleman back there said a few years ago, we were struggling to compete with SSB. Now we're getting some cases we can get our signal through an SSB can on HF, and we're going to push down further. So, yeah, I'd love to talk to you about ways we can work together. 
and making that change happen. But, uh, I'm assuming if you're listening on a normal radio, you just hear noise, do you? Yeah, well, you hear motor tones. But then you can download the software for free and plug it in your laptop and have a listen. Turn mm -hmm. frequencies on HF where you can listen to 14236. 14236. Yeah, that's sort of international. But we really need to get a bit of a head of steam behind this locally. A lot of the guys are playing in the States, but we need nets and things like that. Just following on from that, what do the regulators think about this? Uh, both this mode and also frequency hopping, because yeah. I have heard some analog frequency hopping quite often. Yeah, frequency hopping is frowned on because it spreads spectrum -y. It's being used though. Yes, um, yeah, it's in a grey area. There's also a lot of um, wars over whether it should be voice or data in terms yeah. of band plan. Um, but, but how do the regulators cope with this? For ham radio, no one seems to care at this point. There's a lot of arguments. Well, if it's open to source, they can. They don't have to if it is. Yeah, yeah and that's, 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 that's in fact, in France, for example, um, AMBI's illegal hmm. because it's not open. So it's, it breaks their ham rules. And there's yeah. arguments, people have argued with the FCC that it should be illegal. Uh, because you can't listen to it, or as you can, you can download the software. We had to type up a couple of pages about the algorithm protocol to have it registered as a mobile. But it's still a bit of a grey area. And one of the great things about it, um, ham radio is you are encouraged to do experimental radio. Absolutely. And this, yeah. this is the breaking edge of ham radio, and indeed radio around the world. Mm -hmm. you know, having this all open, and the ability to combine the modem and codec with all open software and play everywhere, yeah. no one else is doing that. None of the commercial guys are doing that either. So this is you know, very different. Has anyone experimented with CDMA using the digital voice or not? Yeah, there's a few, bit of work that's gone on with that at VHF. Yeah. It's a VHF, yeah. Yeah, that helps with that fading issue. Uh, oh, of course, yeah, because you're putting over a wide You're spreading out. over a wide frequency, yeah. so when one's faded, the other isn't. You have diversity, frequency diversity? Yeah, especially diversity. Mm. Uh, I'm already doing a bit of that at HF within a narrow bandwidth, but if you've got issues with fading, generally, although it's, um, I think VHF, as Glenn's pointed out to me, it's, it's frequency. The whole thing goes. Yeah. Flat fade. Roger. Yeah. Um, talking about um, mesh network. Um, have you uh, thought about the uh, mesh network? You know, I guess that's what you're talking about. Yes. Um, where part of the mesh network, mesh network might be VHF and another part might be HF. Yeah. Like go through five. Well, well, actually, I think one part of it could be radio. One part could be the internet. You can have these devices on the edge, and uh, yeah, you can be, you know, shuff, trunking back through the internet to another place. Um, I know some of that's done already in ham circles, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, it could be uh, all mixed bands. If you start the other thing that can be done is if it's received in more than one spot, you can then combine the signal in a server somewhere. So you can have two receivers, but not doing the demodulation there, just sampling, piping into the internet where it's reconstructed, and the sum of the two suddenly you get a really good signal. What sort of latency do you expect if it's going to say five and eight? Um, we've done a lot of work in making this push to talk really fast modems, things like that, so we can control that sort of thing because it's over. Currently, everything syncs up within 80 milliseconds. That's per modem. So it could be some of that, or there might be some clever ways to minimise that. Is that 80 or 80? 80. 80. So you can't tell the difference between push to talk. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, David. I'm sure that David will have uh, <laughs>